sing one more. We ascend in thee on the wings of worship. We ascend in thee.
that she's went to the brain neurologist today and he told her go home and don't come back unless she needed him. He didn't want to see her for six months. Hallelujah. He told her she was perfectly fine and he didn't glory. Didn't he want to see her for six months? Now that's the glory, folks. That's what the presence of God will do. Amen. And you know when all that was conquered? On a Wednesday night. Amen. On a Wednesday night, we got through preaching and the gifts of healing took over and people just kept coming and coming and coming and God kept healing and healing and healing and moving. Amen. And that's some of the fruit of what the glory will do. When you get up in that realm of the Spirit and decree things, it is done. Amen. And I'm just so happy. But you know, she's never received uh, at one report that they've given her. And she'll tell them they're not right when they tell her. She's arguing with one now about her lung, telling him she don't want him doing nothing on her because it ain't there. Amen. And I was just uh, reading some earlier today where Michelle O'Donnell talked about when she didn't know too much about healing and she had this woman come in and she was paralyzed with a stroke and she couldn't even talk and walk or nothing. And uh, she said she would try to talk for me but, and said I didn't want to discourage her but I didn't want to tell her not to either so I just kind of stood there and watched her try. And one morning she was late for work went running down the hallway and when she went running by that room she stopped and backed up the woman wasn't in the bed. And she said, my God, she's died there in the night. And she said, my heart just fell. And said, I looked. And sitting over in the corner was that lady with the biggest smile on her face. And she had absolutely climbed over the railing on that bed. Both the rails were up on the bed and drug herself over to that chair to sit down in it. And the Lord showed her right then that if you'll defy that thing and won't let it become a part of you and will not ever identify with it, that that in itself is enough to heal and reverse the effects of anything that's out of all. Isn't that beautiful? Wonderful. Amen. Amen. I've told you all, I was to, uh, our grandmother, you know, she lived in a realm in the Lord for us. She went 15 years without even a dose of cough syrup, or antibiotic, or aspirin, or anything. But later on in life, there was a doctor, in fact, it's a doctor who delivered me of when I was born, and he insisted she had bladder cancer. He just, he said, I know it, all the signs of their symptoms are there. He even went as far as to have her brought in for a biopsy. And, uh, Glory to God. I watched him tell her, now Ruby, listen to me. He said, we're going to fight this and all this stuff. And she just stared off in the corner of the room, wouldn't even listen to a word he said. And finally, when they got her home, praise God, even my nana tried to sit down right in front of her face and wake her up and get her attention and tell her what. And she said, Mother, do you understand? What he's telling you, she said, I don't accept the word he said. And you know what? She never did manifest no cancer in her body. In the 70s, she did the same thing with a doctor who told her she would die with non-alcoholic cirrhosis of the liver. And glory to God, she did the same thing when she got out of there, she said, oh, I don't believe a word of that. She said, Just like he made it up, you know, she said, I don't believe a word of that. Boy, them girls again, trying to tell her mother the doctor wouldn't just lie to you. She said, I don't believe a word he said. And she never manifested one symptom. Of it. So I believe the report of the Lord tonight. Don't you? You know when you get a pain sometime, all you do is just kick it off and go on like it didn't even happen. You don't stop and go look up what pain in your knee means. 
you may just be putting on a few pounds. Yeah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory. Honest confession. What do they say? Honest confession is good for the soul. Hey, Amen. Come on, Brother Ben, Brother Rick, and receive the offering this evening. God bless all of you for your giving. Be blessed as you give tonight unto the Lord Jesus.
when do you ever see them, many of them, I know there's exceptions to the rule, but when do you ever see the majority of them just give up that talking time and offering time and just show that whole program of the glory of God breathing on the people? I'll tell you one thing. I'm glad that uh, uh, Brother Rodney and them will do that. They've been showing that camp meeting. and Amen. I'm blessed when I see them people get under the glory. But I thank God somebody's got enough nerve to show the glory in the open. And you know, the, they got the one time they was taking people in the back to get them filled with the Holy Ghost because they didn't want it manifesting out in front of everybody. I don't believe in that stuff. I want to see the glory of God when it comes. Let me tell you, if I even think it's it just going to be a uh, a nickel's worth of it manifest anywhere in this room. I'm putting my eyes over where I think it's going to happen because I want to see the presence of the Lord as it fills the temple and as the glory of God moves on the people. But old Brother Heflin went off and he had, was in a horrible car accident and he come walking in the house bleeding and and Sister Heflin said if she poured water in one side of his mouth, it run out the other side. He had a hole on the side of his mouth, and it knocked all four, four of his front teeth almost out of his mouth. They just hanging. And he come in, and his wife said, what are you going to do? He said, well, I preach to all these people that God will heal them. And he said, I'm going in there and go to bed till he wakes me up healed. Right. And he, she said he went and got in that bed and had a hole right here in his, in his uh, lips. She said every time he pour water in one side and run out that hole and said he put a handkerchief between them teeth and bit down on them and went to bed. And when he got up the next morning, hallelujah, all them teeth was back in place yeah. and that hole was closed up right. in his lip. Praise the Lord. Amen. One Sunday afternoon, we were sitting up there eating, and uh, uh, I was putting a string or something on the mantling, and the hat that slipped, and it got a hold of this finger right here and cut it, and uh, they taped it together. Praise God, my, my wonderful sister-in-law tape that finger up where it, and sent it. so she's good once in a while, you know, she helps me out. And she taped that finger up, she have to, my wife can't look at blood, she faints when she sees blood. And I went home, and then I take, I didn't want to look at it, because it don't do no good to look at it, and I went on to church, and I come home at the priest come home that night, and went to wet bed, had her change of dress on that before she said, oh, Honey, if you look at your finger, it wouldn't close up for nothing. I mean, you just you just reach up and scratch your head, forget it, and it'd go to pouring blood. How I many has ever had that? About the, I ain't one way to get it together if, and actually split it together. So it up. And I, she said, I said, well, I'm just going to go to sleep, believing God to close it up. And if He don't close it up by the morning, I'll see about doing something with it. And that night I went to bed, and to make a long story short, I had a dream. And in that dream, Randy's wife, Sissy, come to me and said, anything I want, you want me to do for you? I said, yeah, ask the Lord to put that finger back together. So I, don't, I said, I don't want to go have nothing down on that finger. And uh, I got up the next morning, I didn't think about it because that bandage was full of blood. I took it out and threw it in the garbage, got, went in to get a shower, and I was washing my head. And I said, wait a minute, that finger. And I looked down. Glory to God, it looked just like it looks tonight. I don't mean it had a scab. I don't mean it had to heal. I mean it was totally like it is right now. What happened? The glory of the Lord come down and God moved. So we're going to read these verses to you from Acts the 15th chapter and then we're going to jump back and read some out of Amos 9. Acts 15, beginning in verse 13. Everybody there say amen. amen. Now we know where, right where we're at. We're dealing with the fact that David went and got the glory and brought it home. Brought it back where it belonged. Amen. And it said after they had held their peace, James answered and said, Men and brethren, 
Hearken ye unto me. Simeon declared that God at first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. Well, glory. And to agree the words of the prophet as it is written, after this I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David. Hallelujah. Now that's the line I want you to focus on. I'll build again the tabernacle of David which is falling down and I'll build again the ruins thereof and I'll set it up that the residue of men might seek after the Lord and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called saith the Lord who doeth all these things. Now go back in Acts 9, chapter, uh, Acts 9, Amos 9, the Old Testament, Hosea, Joel, and then Amos, and read with me in verse uh, chapter 9 and verse number uh, 11, verse number 11, and listen, this is the prophecy as it was originally given to Amos. In that day will I raise up the tabernacle of David that is fallen and close up the breaches thereof. Praise the Lord. Now when he does it this time, it won't never fall again. He'll close up the breaches. There'll be no weak spots. Uh, Isaiah 58 the Lord said, Is not this the fast that I have chosen? Is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry and to the poor? And he talked about becoming eyes to the blind. And he talked about being in drought, your soul would be satisfied. But he also said, He shall be called a repairer of the breach and a restorer of past the dwelling. So the Holy Ghost through the prophet Amos said, I'm going to return and rebuild among the people of God the tabernacle of David. Yeah. And when I build it this time, it's fallen now, but when I raise it up again, I'll repair the breaches. I'll close yeah. up the breaches. And listen to what he said, I will raise up his ruins and I will build it as in the days of old that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the heathen which are called by my name. We won't care too much for that, do we? That being heathens is called by his name, but they are, and you better believe every one of them will come in. Verse 13, and that what's going to happen when he rebuilds this day? He said, the days come that the plowman shall overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes, him that sows a seed, and the mountains shall drop sweet wine, and all the hills shall melt. Somebody say, praise the Lord. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. I wasn't going to read this scripture, but I think we ought to go back one more to Isaiah. Get one more in here in Isaiah 2. And let's talk about just for a second here. Read about the mountain of the house of the Lord. This is what the prophecy is talking about. Listen to it in verse 2 of chapter 2. And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow unto it. Glory be to God. And many people shall go and say, Come ye and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord and to the house of the God of Jacob and he will teach us of his ways and we will walk in his paths for out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from 
from Jerusalem. Can you say praise the Lord tonight? All right, and the last place we'll read for now is Psalm 132. This is the very intercessory crying prayer, whatever you want to call it, that stirred David up when he sought after God to bring the ark or bring the glory back to Zion. Amen. Back to Jerusalem. The words of the Lord are in Psalm 132 beginning in the first. Lord, remember David in all his afflictions, how he swear unto the Lord and vowed to the mighty God of Jacob. Surely I will not come into the tabernacle of my house, nor go up to my bed. I will not give sleep to my eyes or slumber to my eyelids until I find out a place for the Lord and a habitation for the mighty God of Jacob. Hallelujah. David said, I can't even sleep a full night because I get up in hunger for the presence and the glory of the Lord. Somebody say amen. And he listened to what David said. Lo, we heard of it in Ephrata. We found it in the fields of the wood. We will go into his tabernacles. We will worship at his footstool. Arise, O Lord, into thy rest. Hallelujah. Thou and the ark of thy strength. Let the priest be clothed with righteousness and let the saints shout for joy, hallelujah, for thy servant David's sake, turn not away the face of thine anointed, hallelujah. Listen now, for the Lord is sworn in truth to David, he will not turn from it of the fruit of thy body while I set upon thy throne. If thy children will keep thy covenant and my testimony that I shall teach them, their children shall also sit upon thy throne forevermore. For the Lord hath chosen Zion and has desired it for yes. his yes. habitation. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. Yes. Glory to God. This is, this is the Lord talking now. This is my rest forever. And here will I dwell, for I have desired it. I will abundantly bless her provision. I will satisfy her poor with bread. I will clothe her priest with salvation, and her saints shall shout aloud for joy. Oh, my God. That's the reason you hear saints shouting around here. Because we are the habitation of the glory of the Lord. Hallelujah. And he said, There will I make the horn of David to bud. I've ordained a lamp for my anointed, and his enemies will I clothe with shame, but upon himself shall his crown flourish. Flourish. Now you've got to understand, we left Saul last week, finished out there. But when David got anointed the third time, he is anointed the first time by Samuel. He is anointed the second time by the people, the elders in Judah. But the third anointing David came into was when he got the whole nation of Israel. And when he got the whole nation of Israel, he fixed his eyes on a place called Zion. He wasn't the only one fixed his eyes on it. Back in Genesis 22, Abraham lifted up his eyes, hunting the mountain where God would provide a ram for a sacrifice. And he set his eyes on David's Zion. Hallelujah. Solomon later would build his temple on the very place of Moriah where Abraham saw by faith the provision. Oh, isn't that wonderful? Hallelujah. But the third time when David got anointed, 
His eyes were open to see that the throne didn't belong just in Judah. The throne belonged on the high place. And the high place was Zion. But on Zion, there was a bunch of Jebusites, as, as carnal thoughts, standing on the wall. And they wouldn't come down. And David got everybody together and promised an inheritance to those who would not pay any attention to the voices of the Jebusite, but would leap over the ditches. Glory to God. Run over the wall and knock down every thought taken into captivity. Every thought that exalted itself against the praise of the Lord. And the Bible said that Joab went up ahead of all of them. And that dude was mean and hateful and he'd kill anybody. But God blessed him because he never would leave David's side. Amen. Hallelujah. And then Jebusites were screaming down to him and said, Why? Said, you're a blind and lame and halt. Said, you couldn't even knock the crippled off of this wall. And the Bible said David's soul loathed or hated, hated the crippled. Now, what did he mean by that? It meant he hated that in his mind something was telling him he couldn't when the Lord had moved on him to do the thing. But the Bible said, nevertheless, David took took the stronghold of Zion. Well, our Jesus said in Matthew 7, until the day from the John, the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffered violence, and the violent what? Take it by force. If it's yours, glory. Why do you let other things tell you you can't live in your own house? He took it, the stronghold of Zion. And then we hear these two prophecies we've read in Amos 9 and Acts 15 where the Lord said of all the places He could have rebuilt, He chose the tabernacle of David. That don't make human sense. There was a tabernacle of Moses with a wonderful heritage of typology of the three feasts in the Lord Jesus Christ but he didn't choose to build that one. There was the grand glory of Solomon's temple, which David designed by his own hand. Biggest monstrosity of gold and emblems and symbolism and every bit of it pointing to the Lord Jesus, and yet the Lord didn't choose to build that tabernacle. There was the temple built by Zerubbabel, after the exiles, 50,000 of them returned from Babylon, in which the prophet Haggai prophesied and said that the glory of this latter house shall be greater than that of the former. But the Lord didn't choose to rebuild that one. There was the temple of Herod of the great, which was built before Jesus, right before, not too long before his own birth in the flesh. Uh, that was so uh, big and huge it was the emblem of the whole city but he didn't choose to build it in fact he tore both temples Solomon's and that one he let Babylon have Solomon's temple Nebuchadnezzar burn it up with fire and he let Titus of Rome have uh, the temple of Herod and they took it apart brick by brick in A.D. 70 and he never said he'd rebuild any of that. But David's tabernacle wasn't even a house. Wasn't even a, it was a tent, a makeshift little tent that was raised up. And all that was in it was the ark. There wasn't any lampstand. There wasn't any showbread. There wasn't any altar of sacrifice. There wasn't any altar of incense. There wasn't any yeah. type of that. Wasn't yeah. no, but I'll tell you what really matters is there weren't no veil in that temple. There was nothing to hide the glory of the Lord. And that's the one God said, the work that I'll do in this hour will not be hid behind the veil. But I'll fill this earth with my glory. Hallelujah. And that's why he 
He said, I'll reveal the tabernacle of David. Now, one thing that we must understand is the anointing that was on David's life for music. Music. David was first and foremost a very gifted musician, having the power to put Saul asleep when evil spirits came to torment him. David could play under the Holy Ghost and shut Saul up. And if you get in the right glory and let the Lord start playing music, the right music on your heart, you'll shut old Saul's mouth. Amen. All that carnal mess that drives you crazy, just let that heavenly glory come on you and start singing in the Spirit and I'll tell you, you'll put Saul to sleep. Well, glory. He is an anointed musician. When he took the stronghold of Zion, he moved everything to Zion. Everything. Now, Zion in the Bible is a principle. We are Zion. The church is Zion. That's what it all boils down to. Zion is a place and Zion is a people. Zion is a place that's above all else. Elevated. The high place. The Lord prophesied to Moses in Deuteronomy, through Moses rather, and said, I'll cause thee to ride in the high places of the earth. Can you say praise the Lord? We even see by the emblem of the cherubim and the eagle that we're meant to get up in the high places of the Spirit. We are uh, given one of which we've read tonight, 15 songs of degrees. Every one of them bringing us higher and higher and higher into the glory of the Lord. In fact, David so moved everything to Zion, he wouldn't let them celebrate nowhere else. Three times a year, every pilgrim went home to find the glory and to worship God. And all three times a year, when they started their ascent, up Mount Zion, there were 15 distinct elevations that went up that mountain and they started at the first song of degrees singing and by the time they got to the top of Zion, they were all in one accord and the whole city was moved with worship and glory and praise unto God. No wonder the Lord chose that place to dwell and have His holy habitation. He inhabits the praises of His people well, I can tell you, when the praises of God are released among the saints, we are lifted up, we are carried up, we are taken up into the glory realms of God. Hallelujah. Incidentally, Solomon's temple had 15 steps that ascended. And every day, 15 Levites got on one per step, starting at the bottom and went through all 15 songs of degrees. Some of those songs include how beautiful and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. But the last song of degrees that was written, which was the highest, what a musician or a play would be called a crescendo, the highest note of the whole show, was when they came in town and this was the last song they always sung in the high. Come bless the Lord, all ye servants of the Lord, which stand by night in the house of the Lord. And all the Bible scholars agree that that was one of the later songs written by David because after the ark of God got in place and the Shekinah glory returned to Mount Zion where it was supposed to be, David could walk out at night and in the glow of the presence of the Lord he could see the Levites as they walked with their hands uplifted and sang praises unto God and he pinned it while he watched it Come bless the Lord, all you servants of the Lord, which stand by night in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands in the holy place. Amen. Amen. The glory. Zion, the Lord had chosen Zion. He had desired it for his holy habitation. He dwells there forever. 
One scripture says that the time, yea, the set time to favor Zion is at hand. Another place says the Lord will appear out of Zion. Another place says out of Zion the beauty and the perfection of God hath appeared. Amen. Zion is the home of the saints of God. We're not trying to get to Zion tonight. We have already taken the stronghold of Zion. We are seated with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Far above all principalities and powers. There ain't no Jebusites on these walls tonight. We have already ascended when he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto them. Glory to God. The ascended ministry ascended life. And after David got everything in place, but you see this cry, the first half of that song, before David ever got the honor. He said, I can't give my eyes rest. I can't sleep. I can't even feel at home in my living room because all I can think about is getting the presence of God back among the people. Now the full account of the retrieval of this is in 2 Samuel 6 and uh, 1 Chronicles, I uh, believe, 14 or 15. And uh, I kindly have been looking today at 1 Chronicles uh, uh, 13. That's where it starts and the story continues to about... Uh, 16 and 17. I've kind of, that's a more detailed instruction. Uh, 2 Samuel 6 is an overall account. 1 Chronicles 13 through 16 and 17, too, I believe, is a detailed, complete, step by step order in which David done it. Now, the Bible says in 1 Chronicles 13, David wouldn't go on his own to get it. It had to be a corporate thing. It had to be something everybody wanted. There ain't nothing no more miserable than to feel like you're the only one hungry in the crowd. Amen. Nothing no more gets you more down than to want the glory so bad and feel like you just can't relate to nobody else how bad you want it. Ain't nothing like you being the only one on fire. You being the one stirred up while everybody else has done dropped their harp on the willow. Somebody say amen. amen. And that's the biggest hurdle a young preacher has to overcome. This is no more uh, harder on a preacher just starting out than to seek God and deliver his soul. Pour his heart out and feel like it's fell on deaf ears. Yeah. That'll discourage a young minister more than anything will. The older you get, the more obsolete you just push out of the way. But, but it, it's to a degree, it just makes you feel like what's the use to bother if I'm going to get stirred up nobody else is. Yeah. Our pastor always said, if you just find one fellow in that whole crowd that believes what you're saying, just stir him down and preach on. Glory to God. Hallelujah. But how many of you understand David knew that for this to be a success, he had to have people of like faith who wanted to see the presence of the Lord and the glory of God. Church ain't going to grow just because one man wants it to. Sheep beget sheep. It's going to take the whole body of Christ getting stirred up together. I remember when such a stirring hit this church in the early 90s. I don't know what happened. Seemed like the minute 1990 turned over, everybody got hungry for a move of God. You never seen so many prayer meetings in all your life. Everybody was on their face seeking God there in that time. Hallelujah. I received the Holy Ghost during those times. Amen. But anyway, it was so powerful until it didn't matter what evangelist come through. Everybody was so ready. All he had to do was just jiggle a little bit, some kind of some scripture, offer some kind of prayer, and it seemed like everybody got everything they was after. Glory to God. We had one revival. 
one revival with J.C. Walker during that time, and 90% of, of the youth of the church got baptized in the Holy Ghost in that one revival. There was a fire, and I'm going to preach hard here for just a few seconds. There was a fire among the young people. We didn't grow up hunting our own thing to do. We grew up in this altar down here speaking in tongues, praying for one another. I'm worried. Praying hard. Because we're bringing up a generation of young people that don't even know yet how to move or what the Holy Ghost is. They ought to do it. Hey, listen, we got kids in this church right now who are already be speaking in tongues. I told you I was going to get hard. You just have to overlook it if you don't believe it, but you might as well get on in and believe it. Amen. Ain't no kid ought to grow up past 12 years old without getting the Holy Ghost. Or by the time they get 12 years old, they ought to already have the Holy Ghost be lifting their hands in church, praising the Lord. These little kids right here, they need to fall out in the Spirit. They need to feel the power of God. They need to cry. They need Jesus to touch them. They need the anointing on them. That's how I got where I'm at today and the rest of us this was in that time period. We was in the altars where God was moving. That's the reason we go get them kids every Sunday night and bring them in this prayer line and lay hands on them. They need to know what the power of God is. The glory ain't for one class of people. It's for the whole bunch. For the whole bunch. Praise the Lord. Now, we can do things at home that helps. We can make our kids listen to the Bible. We can make them pray. And we make them sing church songs. But they ain't nothing going to help them like getting them in the Holy Ghost glory of God and letting it fall off. I, hallelujah. I was born again, sitting on the second pew of this church without anybody helping me. I don't even remember who the evangelist was. When we was in revival, nobody come told me. I just knew that minute I was born of God. Eight years old, I knew. Ten years old, I got the baptism. The Holy Ghost. I went home, and every time I woke up, I'd make sure I could still speak in other tongues. And it, I'd lay there all through the night making sure I had the real thing. Amen. Praise the Lord. Can you say amen? amen? They used to have conventions for just four young people to get blessed and get the Holy Ghost and they'd send them off to there and when they'd come back, they'd come back another person on fire for God. Now, I'm not condemning nothing. I'm just telling you, we got to have that among the saints of God, among the, the youth, the young people. We got to have them in the Holy Ghost. It ain't enough just for them to come sit in church. They got to get a hold of the power of God. They got ministries to fulfill. They got cause of God on their life. And they don't need their head filled with everything but they need their head filled with the glory, the power, the presence of Jesus. David consulted 30,000. By the time he was through, he carried 30,000 men with him to go get the glory. We move as a whole around here. There ain't one person going to jump up and get the glory. We're all going after it. Somebody say praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Where did my time go? And then, uh, all right, I'm going to throw it into overdrive. We all know the story, so let's just get with it. David didn't go the right way the first time. He took a new cart, and that new cart was pulled by oxen. Now hear me and hear me well. The Levites are supposed to carry the ark. Not the bulls, not the carts, not new methods. Now everything's used to get the glory in and it ain't the real genuine. It lacks that feeling. Hallelujah. They use bright lights and smoke and turn everything down in the congregation and make it dark out here and bright up there. That ain't the glory around. That's a bunch of movie stars uh, acting out of production on TV. Can you say amen? And new carts is everywhere. Preachers are reading the latest book on church growth. Before you know it, they're having coffin donuts. And... Yeah. 
Ain't you got churches right now where everybody gets them a Pepsi Cola at the back door and a bag of popcorn, goes and sits on the church pew, drinks Pepsi and eats popcorn while the preacher's preaching the Word and, and so forth and so on. New carts is everywhere. They're rolling everywhere. New cart methods never work. After a while, it won't grow no more because it wasn't ordained of God and it'll fall just like that oxen shook that cart and the cart was trying to fall. You had got so familiar with the environment till he just reached right out like it wasn't nothing and tried to force the glory to go another way than the way it was going. And when you get so familiar with the Spirit of God that you think you can force it your way, I'll tell you it just won't work. You was a fell dead in the presence of the Lord because he tried to force what was happening to not happen. God was taking that off, that ark off that cart. If the Levites had been where they were, they could have took it up. Usher wasn't the Levite. He meant he was going to make that thing function the way he wanted it to function. I've seen preachers say, I'm going to preach Anyway, God knocking people out all over the place and them get up there and shut the whole glory down. That's another user. Putting for, how many is relate to what I'm saying? Put your hand for a second. Oh, no. No, no, no. This thing's going to go my way. Let me tell you, there ain't nothing familiar about the Holy Ghost. When He comes on me, He's come on me more than half my life now. But when He comes on me, there ain't nothing familiar about it. It's just as new, just as fresh, just as lively, just as... Ooh, hallelujah. You know, if you get familiar with stuff, it don't even shake you no more. You get familiar with the noise and it won't bother you no more. You get familiar with the person and you get along with it. But you can't get familiar with the glory. It's new every time it comes on you. It's a whole new experience. Experience in God. Besides that familiarity breach, contempt, isn't that the word? So users dead and David stared. David ran home, hid out, left the ark at Obadiah's house. Somebody come back and there's glowing all over. David said, Where have you been? Oh, said I had to go visit Obadiah. And said, I got over and for some reason everything in that house is blessed. Right. Everything I touched was blessed. Everything, I didn't just say the Lord blessed over it. He didn't say he blessed everything in his house. Ooh, even the love seat was glowing. Even the couches was blessed. Everything you touched was blessed. The Holy Ghost was everywhere. And David, whoa, that stirred him up. And the Bible said he began to seek the Lord. And when he sought the Lord, he said, oh, I know what I did. It's not meant for the ark to come in on some cart driven by an oxen. It's not meant for some man-made system to bring in the glory of God. But it's when the priest of the Lord lift up their voices in their hands and began to pray and worship the Lord of glory that the presence of God fills the atmosphere and the glory is seen in the temple. Hallelujah! The Bible said David went back and this time they all had a tambourine, had a trumpet, had a temple. Now let me stop here and say this. Music is a good companion of the glory. Sing it and play it music will bring the glory into the atmosphere. You can may have service without preaching. May have service once in a while without an offering. But you ain't going to have much of a service without some music and some singing. Somebody say praise the Lord. Why? Because it's when we sing and play and worship that the glory of the Lord is ushered right into our midst. Can you say amen? And some of you, bless your hearts, you need to learn how 
to just quit singing to be singing and get lost in what you're singing. Get lost in the worship. Get lost in the glory of God. I feel sometimes like Paul, there's more needful for you that I remain enough over here that I can help you out. But there are times when if I literally gave way, I wouldn't even know what was going on in this room because I could just lay back in Him and get so yielded to the Lord. That's why loving Thursday night means I don't have to do nothing except just sit in the glory of the other Thursday night, the first uh, 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 25 minutes or so of that uh, Thursday night meeting, you had to remind yourself to breathe. The glory was so thick in this place, nobody had to say a word. It was just the way that it flowed and back and forth and waves of it just coming and going as it will. Amen. The Bible said when Solomon built the temple and they brought the ark, that 120 priests stood up and began to sound the trumpets of God. And when they did, the glory of the Lord filled that house until the priest, the one who was to direct the service, couldn't even stand the minister by the reason of the cloud for the glory had filled all the house where they were sitting. Hallelujah. And I'm telling you tonight, that when David went out, he went out with singing. He went out with praising. He went out with worship. He went out with music. And when he got back to Jerusalem, he entered another realm of glory. He entered the dancing realm. He did. He learned then how to dance before the Lord and before the people and clothed with a linen he thought he brought the glory home in the dance somebody say praise the Lord praise the Lord praise the Lord oh I just wrote I thought I was about finished that gift book and the Lord took me back in there yesterday and I wrote four pages on dancing hallelujah Yes, I'm, I'm telling you, he danced before the Lord with all of his might from one end of that city to the other. And you know what? There was a group down in the streets that went right with him. They got in that realm with him. But there was also one standing in the window looking down on him who hated him in her heart because he dared to dance and play before the Lord that way. The Bible said she despised him, his own wife. Despised him. Why? Because he was supposed to be the big dude, the king, the ruler. And them people, listen to this now, them people were used to looking one way for a king and another way for a priest. They weren't used for having a king among them. They were used to having a king over them. That ruled over them. Saul was a dictator. But David, here David, the king of Israel had totally yielded to another realm of ministry and right among the people of God, he was dancing in their midst and bringing the glory to them. The Bible said when he got done dancing, he fed the whole nation. He fed each one with a loaf of bread, a good piece of flesh, and a flagon of wine. If you want to bless nations, you'll have to dance. In the spirit, you know Sister Heflin told her brother all his years, he wanted to go to the nation so bad, and she was always, and she told him, said, if you don't dance, you won't travel. And he told her, said, well, I've danced enough in the world. I just don't believe in all that dancing. And she said, well, okay. And he said, after about the 30th time of taking her to the airport and waving by, he had to stay while she went to all the nations of the world. He said, bless God, I got out there on that platform and I danced from one end of it to the other. And when he died, he had been to over 80 nations of this globe preaching the gospel because he said when he obeyed what the Lord said, glory be to God. I'll tell you what, there's sometimes I dance because I'm so overwhelmed I, and my feet take off before 
the rest of it, and I could be halfway down this aisle before I realize I passed in the Spirit. But there are other times I'm not overwhelmed so greatly that I could just stand still. I could if I wanted to, but I feel the joy of the Lord. I feel the presence of the Lord, and I feel the dancing Spirit. And you know what I do? I don't wait for the Lord to crank my crank up. If the Spirit ain't moving me just yet, I'll move Him, glory to God, and I'll pick Him up and and put them down. And I'm telling you when David done that, he fed them people. And if I'll dance before God, he'll let me feed you people every Sunday and every Wednesday. When you come and sit in this place, I'll have bread and flesh and wine to give you. If I will learn how to dance in that glory. Hallelujah. Now the final thought is, he come home to bring that glory to his house. The people received him. Levites received him. Uh, the tabernacle was in place. The minute the priest set the ark down, the glory came on that little tent and stayed there. God honored his word. The glory was there. The power was there. But he went home. He didn't go home to fuss. He went home to bless his household with that dancing glory that had come on him. He could dance and when he did, God gave him a new anointing and he came home to bring that new anointing to his house. And instead of being met with, in fact, she should have got out of that window and got out there in the street with him. If you think I'm going to let all my people dance out here while I sit up there and stare a hole through them, new, new. If they get in and get it and it hit up there, yet I'm going down there where they are and get in the middle of it. I'm going to finish this out here in about two minutes and we'll go home and I'll finish it right. I'll help you. She met him. She didn't say, Oh, David, the glory was all over you. She didn't say, How in the world has God been so good to you to let you feed all them people? No, no. She met him at that door and said, What in the king love me out there in that street today? Dancing, pulling his robe off, wearing that priest robe. Priests don't even get a salary. Huh? The Lord's their portion. They turned out to be richer than all of them because the Lord was their portion. He said, that, how, said, what in the king glorious out there dancing before the fan maidens and before the servants. I mean, no, that's what she said. And let me tell you in my translation what he told her. He said, Michael, you ain't seen nothing yet. You just thought I showed out today. Said the next time I go out, I ain't just going to dance. I'm going to play before the Lord. Look, look up that word play. You know what he meant? I'm going to run. I'm going to skip. I'm going to twirl. I'm going to spin. I'm going to raise my hand. I'm going to run. I'm going to leap like the heart. I'm going to shout. I'm going to. He told me, said, I'm going to do it all. He come home to bless her with that new realm of glory. But you know what happened to her? Because she despised dancing, her womb was barren. Until the day she died, she never did produce offspring. And if you look out that wonder and despise that kind of move of the Spirit, you won't bring forth nothing in the kingdom. Your womb will be barren to you. Now here's the thought that I want to close on. I know these people who love God with all their heart are baptized in the Holy Ghost, have been in moves of God, and they say they've never lifted a foot more than an inch off the floor. What about them? Nothing in this world about them. They may never dance one step. Never. They never dance. But if they'll rejoice when others do, if they'll be glad when the other saints does, then God will bring 
glory to God, David right to them just like he was going to bring him to Michael and they'll get the same portion as the ones out there. But the only thing that scripture is not saying people who don't dance don't love God is saying don't despise the move of the Spirit. We've got to get that straight in the glory because sometimes you may see a person sitting there thinking, well, they're not even getting blessed by the glory. And if you got to them, you could see that they couldn't even stand or move or turn because the thick cloud is set on. So we're not just looking for outward moves and signs, but we do want them. When we see them, no matter how dramatic they are, we never despise their glory no matter how it moves. We don't call people down for dancing in this church. We don't call people down when they give out a message. We don't call nobody down when they're worshiping God. Amen. Why? Because we cannot ask for God to fill this house with His glory. And then when He starts moving, tell Him in what manner He must move. David got the glory home when he went about it the right way. When he went out with singing, shouting, Levites. And when he came home, he got a new anointing. God gave him dancing feet. And them dancing feet danced him right into a new dimension where he became a king and a priest. You know what that meant? That meant from that day on, he didn't have to stay out of the ark. He could go right there to it, lay down in the presence of God. Oh, no other king had been allowed to go in there. Even Uzziah got smoked with leprosy in the forehead because he tried to do it. And God said, you ain't a priest. But David said, oh, hallelujah, this day I found out how to minister in both realms. No wonder the Lord said, I'll rebuild the tabernacle of David. That's the king and priest ministry. Hallelujah. So you just remember that these are glory days. And we're expecting, expecting such a release of it out of us every time we come together until we're able to feed whole nations with this kingdom meal. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. Well, we'll have prayer service tomorrow. And then uh, my family is leaving Saturday for a vacation. Be gone a week, but everything, of course, takes up here Sunday morning, 10 o'clock, normal schedule, and we just are praying for you to get so lost in the Spirit this week that you can't find yourself anymore. Amen. God bless you. Hallelujah.